The Scarlet Monastery, a beautiful and serene temple of the holy light found in the north of Tiraspol Glades, a place filled with quiet gardens and sunlit hallways, but also the stronghold of a dangerous and desperate organization of fanatics in the Scarlet Crusade. I'm Shubsy, and today in Warcraft Space and Story, we're going to continue on from last episode and look at another challenge of fantasy storytelling, creating an organization that's evil, cruel, despicable, but still in some ways empathetic. Before we get started properly though, there's a lot of social and political commentary that can be made in telling a story about a religiously motivated fanatical group of people who see themselves as restorers and reclaimers, but Blizzard hasn't done that, and so neither will I. Instead, the lesson, if you want to read one, is more about morality in general in here. The layout and pacing of the Scarlet Monastery is interesting in a lot of ways. There isn't really a pre-dungeon apart from this room, but more noticeable than that are the four separate dungeons that make up the Scarlet Monastery experience, being the graveyard, the library, the armory, and the cathedral. With Vanilla's tendency towards super dungeons with things like Moradon, Strathholm, and especially Blackrock Depths, having a set of dungeons each with no more than two bosses catering to a large level range from the high level 20s through to the early level 40s really makes this space stand out. Part of that is likely to do with accessibility. Easily reachable to the Horde from Undercity or Orgrimmar via Zeppelin, and even relatively accessible to the Alliance, by vanilla standards of course, coming through South Shore, it made sense to every few levels take a quick break from questing and go experience the next chapter of the Scarlet Crusade story. Since Mists of Pandaria, however, the four wings have been combined into two dungeons, with the library and armory making up the Scarlet Halls, and the graveyard and cathedral becoming the Scarlet Monastery. So although the graveyard was the first dungeon in vanilla, we're following the modern level flow and are going to the Scarlet Halls first. The entrance of the Scarlet Hall isn't grand or showy, it's quiet and solemn. We'll see a lot of that in this dungeon. The peaceful and contemplative nature of the space clashes with, and thus highlights, the desperation and violence of the Scarlet Crusade. The first thing that draws our attention would be the Hooded Crusader here, who acts as the main quest giver and drives the primary story through the Scarlet Dungeons, as she tasks you to retrieve the Blades of the Anointed and generally help her get, at this point, unspecified revenge against the Crusade as a whole. It's an interesting shift from these dungeons' original incarnations, which instead of telling one focused story that begins and ends within them, instead tied into the larger Scarlet Crusade storyline across all of Northern Lordaeron, which itself was a part of the greater Scourge vs Forsaken vs Scarlet Crusade vs Argent Dawn geopolitical mess that all started with a certain golden-haired prince. Next to her, of course, we see buckets of raw meat, which don't make sense at all until we turn around and find these mastiffs. So just like in the other Myths revamp dungeon, Razor Fen Kral, a lot was done to make both the Scarlet Halls and Monastery mechanically more engaging, as the meat buckets can be used to distract the hounds, allowing you to skip those pulls. But they're also revealing of something rather interesting story-wise. In a world of earth-shattering magic and technology, honestly far superior to our own, we find the Scarlet Crusade using something as simple and effective as war dogs. The change in the feel of the dungeon as soon as you step into the sunlight is really incredible. Something that you're probably going to hear me say a lot about this space is that it looks amazing. If not for the armed patrols, you'd very easily forget where we are, or perhaps more accurately, when we are, as everything seems so bright and even the normally bleak and oppressive Tiraspol sky is lighter. It all works so well at conjuring memories of better times. And you've got to think, that's how the Crusaders feel about it too. Of course, it's soon back to business with the Crusade as we find this garden path turned into a makeshift archery range. The use of fire arrows again ties into the pragmatism of the Scarlet Crusade. Every member must be willing and able to take up arms and fight against their enemies. And short of a shotgun or chainsaw, fire is a favourite tool against hordes of undead. Leading the practice we find Commander Linden. He's not technically a boss and so doesn't really have lore worth mentioning, though he's an early example of the named mini-bosses Blizzard seems to have become very fond of in Legion. A short hallway leads us to another cloister and our first boss, Houndmaster Brown. 
The Dungeon Journal states that Brown is the person directly responsible for raising and training the dogs of the Scarlet Crusade, and so is basically a straight mirror of the boss he replaced, Houndmaster Loxie. Something quite cool is that the journal explicitly refers to the hounds as savage, and as the fight progresses we see a clear example of that as the dogs tear through not only a bleeding brown, but also the otherwise impenetrable phalanx of Scarlet Crusaders, blocking the path to the rest of the dungeon. So way back in the Ragefire Chasm video, we talked about how enemies in vanilla were equipped in a similar way to the players at that time in level range. Now however, instead of the effectively iconic Scarlet armor set from vanilla, you find enemies using armor and weaponry from across all of the expansions and full raid tier sets. Even fanatics aren't immune to wanting cool mog sets it seems. We again find ourselves going upstairs in order to set up this visual reveal. And as we draw closer to the massive statue challenging us, more and more of them come into view. The stained glass windows behind their heads looking very intentionally like the halos of saints. This is the Hall of Champions. We don't know what its original function in the monastery was, but this space communicates that the Scarlet Crusade at one point was made up of many different races, and was powerful and influential enough to be able to commission great artworks for its heroes. Presumably, this was after Arthas left for Northrend the second time, and prior to the rise of the Forsaken. There would have been a spot of hope, where it looked like humanity may have had a real chance at securing at least some of the Lordaeron subcontinent. Something I find very cool here is that you're usually only able to get 5 statues in your field of view at any one time, which of course is the number of people in a dungeon party, so I can only assume that was intentional. And waiting for us quietly at the bottom of the steps here, we have Armsmaster Harlan. Both he and his predecessor Herod are the greatest living warriors of the Scarlet Crusade. In this case, I mean warrior mechanically too as despite both calling on the light in battle, neither actually makes use of it. Herod in particular is a real focus of nostalgia for many players. He was quite a difficult fight, but basically all of his drops, especially his shoulder and axe, were highly sought after, if not for the stats, simply for the fact they looked really cool. The hallway after Armsmaster Harlan leads us to a, well, another hallway but replacing the racks of weapons and shields with paintings and portraits, and of course laying down a nice red carpet for us, helps make this area feel distinct compared to where we just were. There's also a lot more hustle and bustle as we see relics being moved around for a still unclear purpose. The next room is similar, with scholars and pupils looking over books and scrolls. However, what draws the eye, again thanks to some great use of lighting, is the figure at the end of the room indiscriminately torching everything. This is Flameweaver Kogler, and while the two earlier bosses were essentially just renamed versions of the original, Kogler is effectively the opposite of Arcanist Doan. So while Doan's role was to archive and collect the history of the Crusade, we instead find Kogler trying to erase any evidence of the Scarlet Crusade's many past failures. Beyond that, we don't know much about Kogler's history, which is kind of ironic. Doan, however, we find in the Old Hillsbrad Foothills dungeon, at a meeting concerning the creation of the Ashbringer, so it's safe to assume he was a fairly high ranking member of the Church of the Holy Light before joining the Crusade, and he also was the one to drop the key that originally allowed access to the armory and cathedral dungeons. As Kogler dies, the Hooded Crusader returns to congratulate us on our slaughter, and lead us into the Scarlet Monastery dungeon to keep going. It's not played heavy handedly, the intention isn't to create a Spec Ops The Line style identity crisis or anything, but it does make it clear at this point that the elimination of the Crusade is more personal than she originally let on, and that we may be being used. The Scarlet Monastery, which is confusing because it's all the Scarlet Monastery, begins in the graveyard, with the Crusaders trying desperately to contain the undead using flamethrowers and whatever they possibly can to return them to their graves. In both versions of this space, it's made obvious that the Crusaders are having trouble managing the undead at their doorstep, let alone the far more organised and dangerous ones outside the monastery grounds. What's quite cool is that from a distance it appears that this statue is what we're meant to go towards, as it's quite significantly holding a torn Lordaeron banner and a shield with the symbol of the Holy Light. As we get closer though and see what's happening at the mausoleum behind it, our focus is immediately shifted to the boss. Thanos the Soul Render. 
Blood Mage Thalmos, as he was known in vanilla, and for those of you more familiar with him in Hearthstone, was once responsible for purifying new recruits, as the Dungeon Journal puts it. And it's fairly obvious he must have had some horrifying yet effective methods to be able to convert the scared and desperate people of Lordaeron into loyal zealots. Otherwise interesting is that it's likely he was a high elf in life, as blood mages are rare in general, but what few there are tend to be quelled awry. And just behind him we find the first of the blades of the anointed, unquenchable, and not very a paladin-y sounding sort of name, and one that should definitely be ringing a few alarm bells at this point. The continuing path from Thalnos is a little bit awkward as you go back through much of the graveyard to get to this side door, but it does set up a rather cute moment in which you've just defeated a powerful skeleton mage and his growing army of zombies and spirits, and then the very next thing you see is a crusader drunk to the point of complete obliviousness. While we're still technically in the graveyard, I'd just like to talk briefly about Interrogator Vishas, of Naughty Secrets fame. He's the only boss of the Scarlet Monastery to have been completely cut, as in he has no counterpart or replacement boss, and his encounter space has been made inaccessible. As you may guess from his title and punny name, Vicious was the torturer of the Scarlet Crusade, tearing secrets and confessions out of his victims. There seems to have been a conscious decision by Blizzard in the original Scarlet Monastery to really front load the cruelty and depravity of the Crusade here in the graveyard before showing any possible redeeming qualities, such as the preserving of history and relics from the Northern Human Kingdoms that we see in the original library. Throughout this series I've talked a lot about visual moments or reveals and believe me, there are times where I worry this series is slowly turning into Shupsi appreciates water features and sunlight, but honestly one of the best of these is here, leading up to the Scarlet Cathedral. The low constricted tunnel we walk through focuses our attention directly on the statue dead ahead and the second blade of the anointed, but with each step something grand and beautiful appears before us. It always was great, but the visual polish and fine tuning of the revamped version just turns it up that little bit more. Story wise, what we see is that just like the cloisters of the Scarlet Halls, what should be a place of silence and contemplation is now an active training field. The second blade of the anointed is the Hand of Providence, a much more fitting name. We don't know much about them, but it is interesting to note that for what are described to us as blades of legend, they appear as rusty old iron longswords. On the upper level, we do find something quite surprising though, Scarlet Crusade Monks. It seems confusing at first given that monks seem to be all about balance and patience, but just like you don't necessarily need to be a good guy to use the holy light, you don't have to be a wise and enlightened master to learn to use your body as a weapon. And given how pragmatic and surprisingly accepting the crusade is in terms of warfare, it makes complete sense. The leader of this newest branch of the Scarlet Crusade is Brother Korloff. The dungeon journal states that he learnt from Pandaren ambassadors. Presumably his teachers were of the Hojin, the Pandaren school that would eventually join the Horde, as with their detachment from politics and history of the area, it's likely they saw him as a proud, ambitious and willing fighter who wanted to protect his homeland, which appeals to their philosophy. Defeating Korloff opens the doors for us where a slight reddish mist in the air really sells the idea that this is the Scarlet Cathedral. Originally we would have seen dozens of enemies knelt towards the front of the room, with a few other dangerous pools milling around the sides, but instead we find these small chatty groups. A lot of that would have to do with moving more enemies outside, but there's also a potential story justification, as originally at the altar ahead stood Renault Mograin, son of the legendary Ashbringer Alexandros Mograin, who was one of the founding members of the Scarlet Crusade, and perhaps the current commander, Durand, doesn't hold that kind of respect. Before we start with Durand and the final chapter of the monastery, I'd like to quickly duck to the right into this unassuming side room, in which we find a false wall and behind it the body of High Inquisitor Fairbanks. Fairbanks was the friend and advisor of High Lord Mograine, and the person to witness and thus report on his betrayal effectively becoming the catalyst for the formation of the Argent Dawn. For it, he was murdered and hidden away here, but by that time he'd already contracted the plague of undeath, and so rose again, trapped for years until he was finally granted a true death at some unspecified time. 
Even without knowing any of that, Fairbanks is really cool, because he is the literal skeleton in the Scarlet Crusade's closet, and is obvious evidence that they're not as righteous as they always pretend to be. A lot of Duran's voice lines support the idea that he's not taken as seriously, as he seems overly focused on his legend and flash over substance fighting. Either way, much like Mograine, when you kill him, High Inquisitor appears, takes up the fight. Sally Whitemane is really interesting for a lot of reasons. The Dungeon Journal states that as a young girl she was forced to destroy her own family after they were raised by the plague, and since then she's sunk further and further into rage and cruelty, so obviously found a home among the Scarlet Crusade, and a kindred spirit with Renault Mograine, who was convinced to murder his father and abandon his younger brother. There's another facet to her story though. The Hooded Crusader questline pretty much outright states that she is the reason the Crusaders kept fighting all these years, by resurrecting the Fallen, and the only way to truly stop her is with the Blades of the Anointed. I'm personally a little wary whenever resurrection is treated as canon in-game, especially in a situation like this where the implication is that she can raise dozens of people at a time with little to no side effects, because it leads to snowballing series of questions, the primary of which being, why doesn't everyone just do that then? Either way, the blades are plunged into the High Inquisitor's body, and the Hooded Crusader reveals herself as Lillian Voss, the undead daughter of a former Crusader. At the same time, the blades themselves transform, having been anointed anew in White Man's blood, and turning into dark-looking, ruined daggers. At this point, Lillian takes them and leaves us, her vengeance against the Crusade filled, and the threat of the Crusade seemingly stopped forever. And so closes the story of the Scarlet Monastery, well at least the most direct story tied to the place as it is now. As I said in the beginning, these dungeons were originally a small stage in one of the largest, longest and most multifaceted series of plotlines Blizzard has ever put together, and there's a lot of cool stuff about the Ashbringer Blade, the Mograines and the Fordrings that takes place in, around or because of events here, but following all of that would take more time than we really have and require going through many more spaces to do true justice to. At the core of the Scarlet Monastery though, through every incarnation, is the idea that hatred begets hatred. From the endless cycle of betrayal and corruption in the original dungeons, to Voss wanting to tear the crusade down completely and permanently because of mistreatment by her father. And at the end of the day, it's not something we remotely agree with, but it is something that some part of us understands and even identify as one of the darker parts of being human. Anyhow, that was the story of the space, and how the space has told the story in the Scarlet Monastery. I've been Shubsy, and I hope you enjoyed this video, it's been a long time coming. Part of that I want to blame on Legion, being an expansion that thus far I put a lot, a lot of time into, which is great, but like 90% of it's my fault, so I really apologise. Uh, I know the video got pretty dense at times, trying to juggle two full versions of what's technically four dungeons, but I hope you guys still like it, and if you feel like leaving a comment or some constructive criticism, I absolutely love hearing from you guys. So thank you for your time.